Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video now on Jacques Ellul's propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes. In this video, I will overview the whole book. And I do think that this is essential reading for anyone interested in anti-technological thought. It's certainly right up there with Ellul's own technological society, uh, the works of Kaczynski, etc. Because Ellul gives us a way of thinking about maybe familiar topics, which does not simply reiterate the cliches of the academic industry. He talks about um, ideology, for example, in a way which does not simply reiterate Marx. He talks about repression without simply reiterating the cliches of Freud. He talks about language in a very different way from Derrida. And that is why it's so important for us to have this discussion, which the academic industry largely refuses to have. I just want to mention, if you enjoy this video, you might be interested in my upcoming over 600-page book, Hermeneutical Death, The Technological Destruction of Subjectivity, in which I discuss Jacques Ellul in depth, along with the other great anti-technological thinkers, such as Julius Evola, Martin Heidegger, Penty Linkola, Ted Kaczynski, John Zerzon, Michael Rupert, and John Michael Greer, in contrast with prominent technophiles like Ray Kurzweil, Mark Zuckerberg, and Anita Sarkeesian. This book is almost finished and will be available in paperback and ebook form as early as uh, early September of the present year of 2020. So Elul opens the work on propaganda by noting that contrary to expectation, propaganda always already is technology. Now, by technology, Elul did, does not mean a set of literal physical machines, as you'd normally think. Rather, for him, technology is simply the replacement of spontaneous forms which express the freedom of life with a strict system of rationalization oriented towards maximizing efficiency and adaptability, which, of course, negates the freedom of any element which is incorporated into it. And in that sense, propaganda is indeed technology. He says that propaganda is technique also because it is the expression of certain technical branches of modern science, such as psychology and sociology, in which a set of rigorous rules are imposed even on the propagandist himself. What is in control is really the system of rationalization itself rather than any one evil person. It will noted that propaganda is technology because it analyzes both the subject and his environment with an ability to adapt to different contexts of domination. Like any other modern science, it does this by collecting evidence and obtaining exact quantified measurements of its effects. Well, it was well known that the Americans had adopted the Pavlovian idea that you could have a human malleable subject who would basically become a conditioned bundle of reflexes which would react a predictable way to a given stimulus through having its environment controlled. Uh, it will know that Stalin was also influenced by this idea of Pavlov, and there are far fewer real differences between the American and the Soviet approaches to propaganda than you might think. This is not at all to suggest, however, that propaganda requires individuals to be placed in solitary spaces of observation in the same way that the Pavlovian dog was in the original experiments. Rather, modern propaganda always presupposes that its target is the mass, and this is because a genuine individual who is separate from the mass would simply offer up too much resistance to the functioning of technique, such a person would overwhelm the apparatus with too many genuinely unexpected details. On the other hand, a real crowd is also not a suitable target because it would be too abstract to meet the requirement of predictability, which propaganda needs. The technical requirement of propaganda is instead a real individual, certainly, but one which has been reduced to the average on the basis of having the same common motivations, feelings, weakened defenses, and ease of stimulation as anybody else who has been incorporated into this artificial social system. A great example of this, it will notes, is the radio listener. Such a, a person would satisfy the contradictory conditions of being alone without really being alone. Although there's no relation among the various people tuning into the same radio show, there is indeed an identical influence on them insofar as they all have the same predictable reaction to a given stimulus. It's not only a problem, however, for people listening to the same talk show in the privacy of their own cars spread out all over the country, even if there are literally dozens of people sitting in physical proximity of one another in a theater. The propagandized person 
system is still isolated and paradoxically massified at the same time. Isolation within the mass is precisely the paradoxical technical condition of maximizing influence. Propaganda is therefore totalitarian and that it must take hold of the entire person by formally precluding any divergence from a desired reaction. At the level of language, this means that the person must be immune to any other competing influence, and therefore what seems to be that person's own spontaneous interpretation is really just a reiteration of the artificial rationalization of the system itself. Ironically enough, the Habermasian ideal of communicative action as an accomplishment of modernity is directly contradicted by modern technology's formal need to exclude any real discussion. Education is inevitably colonized by this system, while religion can survive, but only by being incorporated into this system, even if it contradicts its own prehistory before modern technology. For example, now you have the prosperity gospel in which maximizing your economic consumption rather than abstaining from material wealth is the religious duty. You have a religious commitment to social justice, which merely reiterates the, requ the social requirements of the propagandized mass, etc. This is only to be expected because technology is hardwired to use all instruments available and to be continuous, lasting, and to remove any gaps of resistance. By establishing barriers against outside influences, propaganda overwhelms the subject's hardwired reflexes of resistance to the point that even blatant contradictions become invisible to the propagandized person. Even if the contradiction is occasionally noticed, one just goes along with it because breaking from the new condition norm would simply be too painful. Gaps are ruled out also because they would allow the individual to recover his senses by contrasting what he sees now from what he had experienced during the non-propagandized or pre-propagandized phases of his own life. Likewise, propagandists are quite literally technicians of influence. Because propaganda must be rooted in action, it cannot operate in a vacuum. And therefore, even appeals to knowledge are somewhat misleading, because in lieu of the enduring forms of earlier modes of knowledge like Euclidean geometry or the Platonic ideal, propaganda's linguistification only exists if it is literally in the mode of execution, something which makes sense from a technological standpoint. The propagandist, therefore, is not a fellow man who speaks creatively or spontaneously. He's rather a representative of the organization itself. He doesn't speak human words, as would have been the case in earlier times, he rather uses technically calculated words in order to treat patients rather than actually communicate with them. It is actually wrong, therefore, to claim that propaganda is all about beliefs and ideas, as people would normally do. Modern propaganda no longer seeks to change opinions as such, rather to stimulate actions in order to get the individual to irrationally cling to a given procedure itself rather than any particular idea. This is why taking a survey asking people for their beliefs as such is actually a very poor way to predict their actions. Only emphasizing the latter as such, and I would argue from a technological standpoint, would actually accomplish what you are hoping to. The fan in a football game, for example, paradoxically has a type of passive participation because propaganda is only effective if the given individual does not have to consciously choose the action which he still predictably performs. It is wrong to speak, therefore, of orthodoxy or the right belief. It is more a matter of orthopraxy, the right action, which leads to a predetermined goal regardless of personal value judgments. For this reason, the propagandist performs wholly mechanized actions, even if they openly contradict the beliefs which he claims to hold. Paradoxically, propaganda does not mind allowing him to keep these private opinions because its target is not any one individual and his thoughts, but rather the collective itself as a machine. Why action, though? Is it because it makes propaganda's effects irreversible and commits him to break older forms of social organization such as family ties in order to be forced into accepting the new social ties of the mass.
Propaganda must therefore become an automatic reflex rather than an idea which is optionally adopted in the private space of your own mind. Propaganda must be continuous and necessarily in action as an executable system rather than hold the uh, eternal status of the platonic ideal, for example. Even at the level of pre-propaganda, however, we don't have ideology in the sense you would expect, because it's not about changing opinions there either, but rather about modifying character and generating feelings. Sub-propaganda, he notes, can take two routes. This can be uh, conditioning a reflex in response to a given symbol or person, um, and it can also take the form of using the image of God or the sense of sacred as a type of myth which continues to function even in a secular era. Contrary to expectation, propaganda is not about changing people's hermeneutical prejudices because it's not good at that anyway. The problem is rather to short-circuit them altogether. However, because the individual is never exactly neutral, propaganda must still collect knowledge about him, similar to how the later Foucault emphasized in, say, security territory population. Again, uh, technique becomes more sophisticated as it deals with material givens, rather than presuppose a void which can be filled in artificially according to some theoretical model. For this reason, propaganda does not actually contradict the established opinion within the population. It's simply far more efficient to utilize it as such. Propaganda thrives as a technology through establishing targets which are easy to mobilize, and that can only be accomplished through building upon a foundation which is already present within a person, using their feelings, their beliefs, rather than trying to uh, replace them with something um, imagined on a purely theoretical level. Propaganda does this, therefore, by responding to a need which people already have. Marx, for example, actually was a good propagandist in the sense that he recognized the workers' discontent was a pre-existent given which he could make something new from as raw material, but of course propaganda can only do that sort of creative work if it first knows the society it is dealing with in order to do so. For this reason, propaganda cannot succeed if it outright contradicts the given social belief. It must instead express it. And the four great presuppositions under modern technology um, which uh, tech propaganda has to reinforce to function today include things like, you know, we exist in order to be happy. We, of course, are the good ones. Progress and materialism promoted as avant-garde or revolutionary ideals on college campuses are exactly the things which modern technology has universalized, and this is why no propaganda can succeed if it contradicts them. For this reason, even seemingly unrelated fields like science and history can no longer be done objectively. They must instead take on this mythic structure providing a vision of the future which drives a person to act rather than be treated as systems of knowledge as such which would lack the properly um, uh, which would fail to conform with the properly technical requirement of propaganda for action. And of course, because propaganda requires action, you have this very predictable and all too familiar obsession with current events. And the reason for this is you can only get people to act in response to things which are really going on in the present moment, however fabricated the reporting on it might be. B. Though they seem quite important at the time, current events have a short shelf life and seem laughably irrelevant just a few years later. If you want confirmation of this, just take a look at what sort of things uh, graduate students were incorporating into their doctoral dissertations five, six, seven years ago, rather than do the hard work of learning about a theory with lasting value. Um, it's so much easier to just take whatever is trending on Twitter that year and shove it into your dissertation. The problem is something from 2013 seems quite dated in the year 2020. And the same thing will happen, by the way, with like, you know, all of these riots and things going on now it seems super important today. Like, you know, we're making history by overturning global capitalism, by getting endorsements from major corporations to, you know, sell more stupid shit because it's racial awareness day. It'll seem as irrelevant three, four, five years from now as, you know, Ferguson 
seems today. Still, there is a certain technical advantage offered up by the current. Because it is in the present, it rules out the very possibility of wasting time in reflection or explicit logical thinking. You have no time for that bullshit because you have to act immediately. Because the propagandized subject is therefore reduced to a bundle of reflexes rather than a thinker, he or she cannot see inconsistencies even if they are lying out in the open. Much like the purloined letter of Edgar Allan Poe, which nobody can find because it's out there exactly where it is supposed to be. Under these conditions, says Elul, there can be no thought. And in fact, modern man does not think about current problems. He feels them. He reacts, but he does not understand. He is even less capable of spotting any inconsistency between successive facts. Like Linkola, therefore, Lul noted that the grand irony about this obsession with current events is that even though there are things going on right now which should be discussed, uh, for Elul that was something like atomic warfare, for Linkola it's all of the um, environmental destruction which goes on every day, that's not what you hear about. They're drowned out in the news cycle by things as trivial as the latest football score or worse yet news about Caitlyn Jenner. Remember that from like 2015? On a technological level, however, Elul says what makes it news is its dissemination rather than its objective reality. Okay? It is not a matter of content so much as it is a matter of procedure. Not everyone is equally propagandizable, however. A mountain man living out in the woods, for example, is actually immune to this sort of influence because he has not been collectivized into the power leak, which, by the way, is the true object of this influence. This is why propaganda has nothing to do with hermeneutics. Hermeneutical prejudices are always individual, while the collective instead has what Elul calls foci of interest. Propaganda only succeeds by fitting into that, and therefore, intensity is all that matters in collective life, even if that intensity is wholly artificial and fabricated. Therefore, one of the myths of propaganda is that it is mere misinformation. This in turn leads one to believe that knowing correct facts is enough to prevent oneself from being propagandized. This, however, completely misses the point that the most efficient propagandist is the one that realizes he has to minimize lying as a technical requirement of the system functioning. There is no reason by the way, to use facts which are inherently unbelievable, one could succeed so much more if one used the most accurate and convincing data, something which both American and Soviet propagandists realized, by the way. In fact, there's an inverse relation in which the more believable the fact is, the less open to interpretation it might be. This actually works best at the level of isolated sound bites, which cannot be refuted in themselves because they don't build up a proof which would require any proceeding of thinking as such. They simply present a figure which cannot be debated or hermeneutically interpreted at all. The more reliable the facts, the more obscure, therefore, the underlying intentions for using them can be. The broader plan cannot be revealed because propaganda is anti-contextual by its very nature. One has to rule out the opportunity for public communication because Propaganda works by creating an excess of stimulation which provides a veil to mask over the true intentions of the system by squeezing out any gaps which would require hermeneutical engagement by real subjects. Propaganda is therefore best described as a pseudo-interpretation which fundamentally obscures even as it seems to disclose. One can somehow lie without falsifying. In the past, inaccuracy was largely an unintentional flaw which was the result of incompetence. Now, however, it is an intentionally and technically mastered act. In its very definition, therefore, Elul says that propaganda is a set of methods employed by an organized group that wants to bring about active or passive participation in its actions of a mass of individuals, psychologically unified through psychological manipulation and incorporated successfully into an organization. Propaganda, however, 
uh, does not have any one single form, although it does have a certain consistent definition, as just noted. It can take a political form, which is more obvious, in which the aim is to disseminate an ideology in order to make certain political acts accepted. The sociological variety, however, is directed more towards integrating the maximum number of people into the same behavioral pattern. The aim is to change an entire style of life rather than to modify opinions. This includes advertising, public relations, even cinema. Above all, propaganda must change the person's environment. But what does that mean except changing one's context from a somatic one in which real hermeneutical interpretation can and rather must take place to a technological one of conditioned reflexes and pre-digested linguistifications which don't even require thought? This is because the suggestibility of a person directly depends on what kind of environment he or she is situated in. In a properly Orwellian sense, the good simply comes to function as a redundancy for talk of the familiar. One of the technical requirements of the system is that because mass production requires mass consumption, this in turn requires widespread identical views, which requires superior technical methods to win out in what should be emphasized is an amoral level. We can contrast the propaganda of agitation with integration in order to understand how this might occur at the level of technology. A propaganda of agitation is more visible in that you are directly trying to agitate uh, the populace towards warfare or something like that. And this is done by forcing you out of the everyday life into some explicitly recognized action. However, it suffers from the uh, drawback that if the goal is not reached soon, the enthusiasm risks breaking down pretty quickly. Likewise, the kind of methods are usually quite crude, such as pushing the most primitive buttons to make people feel hate, blame, hunger, etc. on demand. Propaganda of integration, on the other hand, is more sophisticated. It didn't really exist before the 20th century because it is characteristic of a more technologically developed society as such. It is, above all, the propaganda of conformity. Total adherence is required now because the only path to self-fulfillment could be as a part of a whole collective. Unlike the propaganda of agitation, which is more or less limited to urgent occasions and then wears off, this kind of propaganda is constant and permanent. Above all, it thrives on the principle of comfort. It fits the modern suburbanite, in other words, more than the pre-modern peasant, because it presupposes a certain kind of audience which is more power leaked and has really sold his or her soul in exchange for the mostly meaningless modern comforts of suburbia such as central heating, internet access, TV shows, and fast food. We can also contrast, however, vertical and horizontal propaganda. In vertical or, you know, classic propaganda, you have a leader who is a head with authority who speaks to the crowd situated below him. However, because one is alone in the crowd, there's no communication among the others, so the leader has to constantly renew the propaganda or it won't exist at all. In contrast, horizontal propaganda is much more recent and more sophisticated, as it is made inside the group itself without any need for a determinate leader. This is kind of the system's neatest trick, because social differences and friction is a technical problem for the power leak because it inhibits its horizontal uh, propaganda from functioning. Social categories like race, gender, sexual orientation, religion um, are things which must be ironed out and all factors eliminated which might distract attention, splinter motivations, and prevent the establishment of the proper line. In other words, because you have to be power leaked into the collective, family itself becomes a technical problem because this would merely be an obstacle which would compromise your integration into the collective. If you've ever wondered why family either disappears under modern technology or it's allowed to continue existing, but only for the purpose of having kids in order to brag to your neighbors and uh, co-workers about how much money they're making and how prestigious a career they're advancing in, well, now you know. Chapter 2, The Conditions for the Existence of Propaganda. You will know that propaganda requires a certain milieu for its growth, but this is not the traditional milieu of what I would call an ecological context. Rather, it is the artificial milieu of linguistification per se, purely historical factors which would define one's 
conditions of existence earlier have now become purely accidental. Instead, uh, being connected with a number of scientific discourses takes precedence. And this is because modern propaganda just cannot exist without mass media, transportation, urban crowding. And yet the kind of modern crowd you get, even when the scope of the system becomes global, is not simply a bigger version of the traditional agora or forum. Rather, under the power leak, you have this paradox in which the larger the system becomes, the more degraded the individuals um, and their abilities um, uh, have to become because you are not simply adding them all together without losing anything. Rather, you have a very strange sense in which the collective requires a certain um, deterioration of each of its members. Because propaganda is technology, it's not any one person's invention, it's something which is already there on its own as the objective factor of modernity. The irony about this non-ecological context is that it is both individualist and collectivist at once. Yet the kind of individuals needed for such a mass society are ones who are isolated even while inhabiting grotesquely overpopulated spaces. It is a hard technical requirement of propaganda to suspend the organic small group because the kind of structured material, spiritual, and emotion life which had existed there cannot be easily penetrated at will by whatever influence the system happens to desire to be implemented. Lacking geographical ties to a place or ties to your ancestors, one is instead uprooted into the urban non-place characterized by the purely negative features of constant uncertainty and mobility. Peasants, it will note, were the hardest to propagandize in Russia because they had not suspended their traditional somatic context as the urban populations had. Likewise, power leak collectivization is not optional. It is a required uh, structure of propaganda itself. Another irony, though, is that although propaganda must be constant, the crowd is by definition a temporary and ad hoc organization. It is not at all like the permanent social cycle of the peasant's extended family, a village or religious group. The reason why mass society requires crowding is that the power leaked individual who is a part of it is inherently more suggestible. This is because the way symbols are processed phenomenologically changes from the traditional individual to the one who has been power leaked into the status of being a cog in the system. For example, although tribal societies have symbols and stereotypes, they're more fixed and religious in nature. The irony is that under technological linguistification, symbols become fluid and they invoke strong but fleeting emotions. The physical proximity of the crowd, however, is required for the majority effect to work. If you have a claim that all Frenchmen want X, this requires the mass to actually feel this on an immediate level of realness by registering the pseudo-presence of the power-leaked mass of which they are part, in a certain imposture taking the place of the somatic presence of the soma. Following the leader is therefore always just following the mass, because a solitary leader under the power leak becomes in itself an oxymoron and technical impossibility. It will noted that one can contrast this situation with the traditional society in which local psychological influence is dominated in the absence of any centrally coordinated massified propaganda with purely technological origins. For example, the family and the church of tradition are, in a certain sense, preserved in appearance and name, but only to the extent that they reinforce the technical requirements of the system of propaganda. So whereas you had the image of Saint Anthony of the Desert in the early centuries of Christianity, a man who considered the temptation to sin to be the temptation for material wealth, um, you contrast that with the prosperity gospel of today in which it's literally become a religious duty to make more money and be a better consumer. However, Elul acknowledges that we usually get the order of operations backwards. It's the conditions of sociological massification which come first, and the propaganda on a linguistic level follows after. That is to say, you have to already be power leaked into the collective before the linguistification can occur at any determinate symbolic level. 
Like Zerzan, therefore, Elul acknowledged that the small group would allow a certain spontaneous democracy of direct experience, personal acquaintance, and an immediate grasp of facts, which could be hermeneutically evaluated with one's own faculty of judgment. In contrast, propaganda's conditions are merely negative. They are the negation of each of these positive factors I just mentioned. Symbols of public opinion, therefore, have an inverse relation to reality. Propaganda negates the direct experience of the small group in favor of a type of linguistification which is always secondhand. This requires a technology of mass communication in itself, which is centrally coordinated but diversified at the level of production and dissemination. Because such a monopoly is a technical requirement, the power leak has an inherent cost as its scope grows, um, which becomes so high that only the state can foot the bill. It's no coincidence, then, that the power-leaked individual consistently defends public goods bureaucracies, no matter how corrupt, incompetent, and expensive, expensive and wasteful they become. Illul's definition of propaganda, therefore, overlaps nearly perfectly with his definition of technique in the technological society. It replaces vague opinions with clear and active forms. Likewise, propaganda does not only change opinions, it reinforces them. Likewise, propaganda actually requires a fairly high standard of living in order to work. If you're too poor to own a television set, you can't exactly be influenced by what's being shown on it. Also, if you're so poor that you only have time to concentrate on meeting the most basic survival needs, you can't find time to care about the base political distractions which happen to be fashionable today. On a Kaczynskian level, therefore, propaganda presupposes a victim who is consumed in surrogate activities because the system has already automated all away all the real work dedicated to satisfying serious needs. This is why Elul repeatedly notes that true peasants living in what would be considered pre-modern conditions are intrinsically less propagandizable. Likewise, it's wrong to say that propaganda is a tool of the elites or a conspiracy by you know, a handful of billionaires, as uh, young Turks would claim. There are simply too a few of them, and their concerns are too remote from the power elite masses in order to fulfill the technical requirements of propaganda. Instead, propaganda comes from the middle class, who are dense, yet super power leaked. They replace the freedom for each individual to just spontaneously be what they already are, with a strict, explicit norm of how all people should be. This technical normalization in which any normal person would have a three-hour daily commute, an air-conditioned office, living in suburban sprawl, which actually nobody lived in until very recently, that is itself propaganda. Like Evola, therefore, Elul acknowledges that the differences between uh, communist Marxist ideology and American behaviorism are more apparent than real. Both are just euphemisms for the same power leak, which has identical technical requirements and effects regardless of how they are phrased ideologically. Propaganda, therefore, replaces culture because cultural ad artifacts would have to become inaccessible without the avenue which propaganda provides. Uh, proof of this is the strange thing which happened in communist China, where Mao produced a simplified script in order to maximize readership, but literally printed nothing in this new language except communist propaganda tracts. <laughs> this need of a certain cultural level to make people susceptible to propaganda, Ilul says, is best understood if one looks at one of propaganda's most important devices, which is the manipulation of symbols itself. The more the individual participates in the society in which he lives, the more he will cling to stereotype symbols which express collective notions about the past and future of his group. The more stereotypes in a culture, the easier to form public opinion. Gadamer's false dichotomy between language and sensation, in which, you know, as long as you have this horizon of linguistic freedom, hermeneutics is still salvaged. This argument is destroyed precisely by the sort of excessive linguistification, which is a technical requirement of propaganda. This is because propaganda and information are not actually opposites. Rather, it is the curse of clarity itself which rules out hermeneutical freedom by presenting figures which are so fixed as to rule out any need for subjective meddling. In addition, these figures never just function in a vacuum, they rather build on a certain feedback loop in which the more symbols you have seen, the easier it is to process the next one in the set. 
Peasants are unreachable by propaganda precisely because they are uninformed in the literal sense of lacking exposure to an artificial system of symbols which make up the pseudo-context of the power-leaked mass living under linguistification. Propaganda is meaningless without this requisite pre-information, which must be, in fact, facts rather than blatant errors. Information actually accomplishes the goal of situating man into a context in which he's able to care about certain issues which are trending. But this is a pseudo-hermeneutical context of linguistication rather than a real hermeneutical context of ecology. Ilul notes information actually generates the problems that propaganda exploits and for which it pretends to offer solutions. Likewise, because identical information is fed everywhere, people are all propagandized the same. But that just means that we're all equally nobody, rather than say that we all have the same positive features. The same information on a linguistic level results in a set of common reflexes and common fabricated prejudices. It's actually not the other way around. It is language which creates the conditions for an identical pseudo-perception of the world at the level of having manipulated organisms which are conditioned by information to uh, react the same. It is not the other way around, as somebody like Gadamer would probably argue. Therefore, in Chapter 3, The Necessity of Propaganda, he asks whether propaganda is really a choice made by a few evil people, in which the propagandist is an active factor in contrast with the crowd who assumes the status of a passive factor. Under this view, it's only a few people who are guilty while everyone else is innocent. The masses are not, however, totally passive because they get satisfaction from propaganda, and it only works because it responds to a certain need which they already have. Because of population density and urbanization, for example, the ruler is no longer remote from the masses. The mass itself becomes more uniform as local differences among populations vanish due to everyone having identical consumption habits. This was not necessarily planned by any one ruler, especially. It was just a natural demographic change with amoral technological origins. However, another thing which has become uniform is that for the first time in modernity, political decisions affect everybody. The public opinion which responds, however, is necessarily that of the mass rather than any individual. However, because mass opinion is inherently unstable and prone to rapid change, you cannot actually base strict policy for the system upon what it says. Instead, technical needs will always win out in a competition with public opinion as such. However, if you're, you are in a certain bind because you cannot follow public opinion, but you also cannot ignore it. The only choice is for public opinion to follow after the system rather than the other way around. This means that the public can express only that which the system has already identified as a technical requirement for the machine to function as an extended self-propagating system, rather than a forum for people to actually express their own opinions spontaneously. Likewise, defining democracy in contrast with states of propaganda in the sense of totalitarian dictatorships, this is the point that democracy can only function through the technology of propaganda. If you have a situation in which millions of voices are allowed to speak, but they all have just one identical message, no matter which one of them you examine, that is no coincidence. The whole point is rather to make people formally demand what the system has already decided it's going to do anyway. Regardless of origin, therefore, propaganda destroys one's personality and freedom. Because of the curse of clarity, the propagandized values become the only ones. And once again, propaganda does not exactly contradict people's need, but instead works with it to maximize desired outcomes, quite a similar way to how Foucault identified security works on populations. This need is one which Elul, however, speculates to be universal. He says that because of human nature's own requirement to express something, it would rather express stupidity um, than not to express at all. In other words, even a surrogate activity is good enough if the absolute bare minimum structure of the power process is retained, and use Ted Kaczynski's words. This need to maintain the illusion of power becomes more important precisely as technology makes real power more impossible. Because technology has already obtained global scope, the problems of today have grown so large, in fact, that man literally cannot fit them into the small space of his mind. 
However, to realize this formally would mean that the very possibility of power were lost. So instead, he clings to his propaganda as the only way to keep functioning as though this were not true. Another thing which has grown along with the size of the technological system, by the way, is its dominance over daily life. Modern man works more than people who were literally slaves in the ancient world, and even the money alone gained from doing so is not enough to appease the truly enslaved masses. Only propaganda can meet the psychological need to endure so much work. Likewise, because the conditions of urban crowding, excessive taxation, anonymity, and long work hours become ever more unnatural, the propaganda becomes a drope because the powerful motives required to main, or remain minimally functional have to come from the system itself rather than one's own spontaneous agency. Technology also grows the size of the system of linguistification so large that man finds himself in a kind of kaleidoscope in which thousands of unconnected images follow each other rapidly in a flood of symbols which devolve into a chaos of noise rather than an abundance of so much more meaning. Because of his deeper needs, however, man cannot accept a chaotic world in which problems fundamentally lack solution. Propaganda alone can provide order and answers in the midst of all of this. Propaganda succeeds, therefore, because the mass has a need for value, even an all-embracing view of the world, but the global scope of technology, ironically enough, makes these impossible to fulfill on one's own. Paradoxically, the larger the crowd becomes through global overpopulation, the more alone each person becomes. The mass man has become a victim of emptiness in search of anything to fill this inner void. And the grand irony is that although secularism is a technical requirement of the system, propaganda only succeeds by quite literally fulfilling people's religious need to believe and to obey. Illo warns us that mere information cannot satisfy these needs, but the technology of propaganda can because it provides the signal announcing to the passive that they are finally allowed to act. This becomes more important the more one realizes that he or she is a mere cog in a mechanized social whole, for which any true freedom to influence the machine becomes ever more far-fetched as it progresses. Propaganda is therefore what Nietzsche would call ressentiment, because it allows you to take revenge against your own powerlessness under modern technology by being more enlightened than thou, as you could see with modern leftists especially. Not only does my opinion now matter, it matters for the whole world, as you could see with leftists once again. Elul was careful to note, though, that only propaganda can allow a release of all of these bottled-up drives precisely because it is more than mere entertainment. It largely functions, though, by allowing you to openly hate by making it into your ethical duty to act out horribly in public, but this only makes sense when you consider that propaganda is inherently confrontational. It is a strict technical requirement that it must have an enemy, and of course the only thing you can do with the enemy is to hate them. What would otherwise be a shameful private vice to be hidden is now thought of as totally legitimate because it's meant to be done out in the public. If you consider the case of Marquise Love, who was arrested today for um, beating somebody unconscious after he tried not to run over riders blocking the road, one can imagine that he expected to become something like an international hero. He was doing his duty of public hate, which the system itself had mandated and was legitimately surprised to find that he would be punished for it. Propaganda is therefore not an empty void without any further qualification. It's more like a bundle of viral code which attaches itself to a person and then drives him to play its game and act out its instructions, much like the ecologically impossible object of Pentelinkula's philosophy, as I noted in my fifth book, Propaganda allows one to overcome the anxiety caused by seeing so many contradictions in one's midst by providing an artificial structure for one's own self-justification. For this reason, people actively demand more propaganda rather than resist it. Therefore, in Chapter 4, The Psychological Effects of Propaganda, you noted that we usually think propaganda is only meant to change a person's vote, and then it's done. But it actually changes a lot more than that. It changes your impulses, reflexes, and deep psychological structures. Propaganda is a machine which makes vague drives clear, direct, and precise, 
by incorporating them into a teleological system which gives them an objective. On a linguistic level, it does this by replacing vague notions with a set of ready-made judgments. Ironically, propaganda accomplishes this by squeezing out all other personal judgments by devaluing them in advance as inferior to the one which is supplied by technique, quite similar to how he noted in the technological society occurs on a purely epistemological level as well. This social rationalization, however, produces a set of monolithic one-dimensional beings who resist new ideas because they would negate the artificial sense of order to which they have become accustomed. The greatest irony is that the propagandized power-leaked pseudo-subject reacts to any new ideas by dismissing them as propaganda. The worst form of alienation is, of course, to be deprived of your own self, and yet this is exactly what propaganda causes, by making the individual disappear, by depriving him of his own personal judgments. This is not exactly optional. Because of technology's tendency to expand the scope of the system, the propaganda eventually becomes so large in size and so complicated that a person has no choice except to accept all of it without question. One should bear in mind that the power-leaked collective is incapable of real thinking because collective critical judgment is itself an oxymoron. Ironically, the mass collective therefore needs the cult of the individual hero, or in our era this is the celebrity, in order to fill the placeholder of the magic individual which I can't be, the one who can do what I can't. In a certain sense, this love for the hero is a response to our natural need to have friends, to have community, to have people we can trust. But this need becomes ever harder to fulfill as technology breaks down traditional social structures and forces humans to live under ever more stressful and unnatural conditions. As a result, in order to remain minimally functional, I eventually come to suffer from the delusion that the hero loves me as much as I love him or her. For example, you can have a man suffer from the delusion that some Hollywood actress or pop singer loves him as much as he loves her from afar. Or you could have just the same for a female. I remember when Michael Jackson um, would uh, travel in public, he would have you know fans you know break down crying, oh, oh, I love you, Michael, and he would always say, I love you back. As though he realized he had to maintain this illusion of the hero's love, even though it wasn't exactly true. This only gets worse over time, however, because technology creates its own positive feedback loops in much the same way that it was the invention of the TV which created the need for a TV, rather than the other way around. Technology, however, progressively eliminates any personal needs and inclinations because what takes place, as I quote him, is, a tr is truly an expulsion of the individual outside of himself, designed to deliver himself to the abstract forces of technically oriented mechanisms. Contrary to the idea that propaganda controls your thoughts, it actually separates you from them. The power-leaked individual is the one who can act without thinking and who can't translate his own thoughts into action. The paradox of linguistification, in other words, is that it eventually makes language itself, the traditional instrument of the mind, become pure sound, a symbol directly evoking feelings and reflexes rather than your own ideas. The irony, however, is that this occurs through excessive clarity rather than through maintaining the kind of obscurity and ambiguity which would allow hermeneutical interpretation to take place. Over time, the Pavlovian conditioning removes the very need to even read inscriptions in the media as such. He says eventually recognizing splashes of color which had become familiar through sheer repetition is sufficient to awaken the desired reflexes in him. Propaganda is therefore one more executable system which defines the essence of technology itself. Because it is technology, its effects must be constantly reproduced and the stimulus must be continually renewed for the targeted pseudo-subject. One is immersed in an immediate present without past and future for which one has the feeling of being delivered, tied hand and foot to an unknown destiny. From the moment propaganda begins with its machine and its organization, one can no longer stop it. Therefore, in Chapter 5, The Sociopolitical Effects, he notes that 19th century views on ideology are no longer relevant. This is because the 19th century emphasized the search for ends, while the 20th century was the shift towards seeing the world as a world of means, something which uh, Foucault also sort of talks about in his later work. Ideology is a manifold to meet the needs of propaganda qua technology and not the other way around, in other words. 
This is because, on a purely technological level, efficiency is far more important than belief. Propaganda does not obey ideology, but rather its own laws as an autonomous, amoral, self-propagating system. The propagandist is not the true believer in an idea. He is a technician with a keyboard of techniques at his disposal. The goal is not ideological, it's technical. It is simply the maximization of a number of colonized individuals. And for contrary to expectation, the propagandized public is actually largely ignorant of the content of ideology because mobilization to action works despite blatant contradictions within it. The words are not representatives of the ideology, but are technologies engineered to set off desired reflexes without having to be processed mentally as thoughts. Rather than open pathways for dialogue to happen, words become mere stimuli to influence an organism in a predictable and teleological manner. For this reason, Elul is the exact antithesis of Habermas with regard to public opinion and communication. Propaganda's issues, contrary to what they might uh, say, don't actually demand discussion because they are not controversies. You either believe them or you don't. You don't actually discuss them. Likewise, contrary to the myth of consensus, public opinion is never derived from individual opinions which meet one another in dialogue. The power leak is not a composite of many individuals because from the start it is collectivized. One moves from one public opinion to another in a, change, in a chain which never assumes the status of private or individual opinion. This only makes sense when you realize that the public changes on a technical level first, while what seem to be individual opinions only ever follow after. As a self-propagating technological system, rather than a composite of many individual wills, this eliminates deviant ideas and simplifies itself by nature, rather than allowing genuine uh, communicative action to occur. This simplification leads black and white solutions to become the only terms considered because under propaganda, even prejudice itself loses its individual hermeneutical status and instead becomes collective and technical by nature. As public opinion progresses, individual opinion eventually becomes impossible. Once again, as an executable system, the power leaked as a part of an executable system, the power leaked individual is plunged into continuous and automatic action. Because insofar as you have action at all, it is a set of coordinated influences rather than any spontaneous expression of your own agency. Under the power leak, action is always carried out by the hive rather than by me. The group acts without judging its position because the very need for judgment vanishes amidst a technical coordination of movement which a priori rules out debate. Propaganda creates certain feedback loops in which the more you listen to Young Turks, the more you're convinced that they alone are right. And yet the result of this is a partitioned society in which the Habermas in dialogue becomes laughably disproven as impossible. There is no common language among people propagandized by different political parties. Like Zerzan, therefore, Elul argues that propaganda presupposes a certain artificial hierarchical social organization in which, we, which people know their place on a ritualistic level without having to actually understand it. It is perverse, therefore, to claim that democracy is the antithesis of a propaganda state because propaganda qua technology began in its modern form precisely in the democratic states. Democracies claim to individual freedom and rationality are therefore fictions which contradict the technical requirements of any modern democratic state. Democracy is enslaved to the technology of propaganda because it is held hostage to the myth that progress is inevitable. Besides, if a few very powerful companies control all the media channels, to what extent are we free, even if the state is nominally democratic? Even claims to freedom of expression are not quite as universal as they seem, since except exceptions are made for anyone called an enemy of freedom. That, that person must be deplatformed. As technology, propaganda is always already totalitarian, even if the state in which it operates is nominally not so. Like Foucault, Elul argued that the means impose their own laws without any presupposition about ends. Propaganda is destructive, but not because of the content of its doctrine, but because of its structural character as technology. Proof is that you can hold the democratic idea in your head while outright contradicting it on a technological level. For this reason, it is precisely the idea that propaganda is only empty talk by totalitarian dictators that makes you ignore it as something harmless and certainly unable to affect you.